Well, it's nice to see everybody here this afternoon. These are great times in D.C. Baseball team won yesterday. The, Nat, the, the Caps won yesterday. The Wizards won last night. The yes. Boston's are out. It, it is. First day of the season. Congress is out of session. It's wonderful. Um, I'm Steve Cheney. I'm the CEO of the American Security Project. Uh, first, let me let me get some thanks to Paul Hamill. The Paul just ran out on me. Uh, he helped set this up, and I know he knows Sir Martin, and I'm very appreciative for what he did. And Matthew Wallen, who's running around in the back taking pictures, is our uh, fellow for public diplomacy. And this is a new kind of area for ASP, and we're glad to have Matthew here working on it. Uh, we just pointed out there's our Wi-Fi, there's our hashtag. Uh, it is on the record. We are going to tape it. We'll have it up on our website late this afternoon or tonight. Uh, let me lay out some quick ground rules. I'm going to talk for just a, a minute or two, then introduce Nelson Cunningham <coughs> on our board, and he will introduce Sir Martin. You're welcome to talk as long as you want. And then when he's done, we'll take this down and we'll have a collegial little talk. I'll open it up to Q&A. Some ground rules on Q&A. It's a small room. We don't have a roving mic. I'll choose who's going to ask the question. You can stand up, speak loudly, have a short question, state your name and affiliation, and I'll repeat these when we get to that point. Uh, let me talk for a second about the American Security Project, founded by Senators Kerry, Hagel, Hart, and Rudman, names I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, we take on topical issues from a national security perspective, and we, we've built our board that way. It's, it's bipartisan with a strong national security component. Uh, we're very, very proud of our board. General Lester Lyles is now the chairman of USAA. He's on our board. Uh, Governor Whitman is now uh, helping work with a nonprofit that's establishing standards for fracking, so we're excited about that. And not the least of which is Nelson Cunningham, who was named president of McClarty Associates. So now we have a former, we have now a current Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, and president on our board. So we're, we're very excited about that. But on to today's business, which is going to talk about branding, global politics, and public diplomacy. And I'll, just a short story about branding, and I was telling Sir Martin about this earlier. Uh, if you're not familiar with Marines, shame on you for starters, but I think you probably remember slogans like the few, the proud, the Marines. We didn't promise you a rose garden. Um, those were all invented by a company called J. Walter Thompson. And the Marines have had a relationship with them for 40 plus years, maybe more. Now, when I became a general and was assigned as commanding general at Paris Island, I got into the recruiting business there and recruited the Marines for the United States, they send you to J. Walter Thompson School. And so you learn their branding or their side of branding and how they work that in their media relationships. I point that out to you because J. Walter Thompson is owned by this man. So I think Sir Martin knows a bit about branding for sure, and he'll certainly relay that to us today. Um, so I'm pleased to have him there. And with that, let me introduce Nelson Cunningham from our board of directors. Nelson. Well, thanks very much, Steve. Uh, I uh, can't tell you how proud I am of the service that I have here on ASP's board. I was one of the original founding board members. And as I look around and think about the people who sat around that table at our first board meeting, there was Secretary of State John Kerry, Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, there was uh, Under Secretary for International Affairs and Treasury Lyle Brainerd, there was UN, uh, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Susan Rice, there was former uh, counsel to the President Greg Craig. I asked myself, what have I done wrong? <laughs> It has been a, it's a great organization, and it really was a testament to then Senator Kerry's vision uh, after the 2004 elections that we needed to get back to a place where foreign policy wasn't a partisan football, but was instead something where you could find common ground on both sides. And I've been very proud with this organization to help work to build a board that, as Steve outlined, is really it's uh, one third Democrats, one third Republicans and one-third retired flag officers who are the, really, who provide us the concrete foundation uh, upon which those of us in the political world can try to come together and find common solutions on critical national security issues. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that we've done across a whole host of issues. Uh, this public diplomacy uh, series which we have, uh, 
takes us into a bit of a different place. It's it's one where I, I, mean, I was fast. I actually didn't know the J. Walter Thompson piece until you just laid that out, Steve. I was going to say that the advertising world and the public diplomacy world maybe didn't have a lot to do with national security, but maybe actually it has everything to do with national security. Because when you think about it, it is in my business, traveling the world, many of you uh, also think about international affairs deeply. Uh, you know, when you think about China is rising, India is rising, Brazil is on the brink, uh, Russia is in trouble. You ask yourselves, how do we form our perceptions of these countries? How do we, how do we know who's rising? How do we know who's falling? Where do we get that sense? I think what we're about to hear today uh, is that this isn't just part of government sort of informally trying to influence how they're viewed in the world, but maybe the way that governments more formally try to uh, establish their profiles in the world and to brand themselves, and uh, to use a crass commercial term, to brand themselves, uh, and to try to sort of use their attributes to help create an image in the mind of the public that helps those countries carry out their, their national goals, whether it's a small country like Singapore, uh, a giant country like China, or a small but uh, but vibrant trading power like Chile. Um, and we have here to help us today to discuss this topic, uh, I think, without a doubt, uh, the world's greatest mind uh, when it comes to thinking about uh, public affairs. We will go far. <laughs> oh, should I just stop right there? Just, I'll just stop right there. My mother would be so proud. No, but, but you all know how lucky we here at ASP are, and all of us in this room, to be able to have uh, Sir Martin here with us. Uh, WPP, the company that he founded in 1985, um, today has 165,000 employees around the world. They have 3,000 offices in 110 countries. Uh, they advise, you know, it's almost ridiculous, you know, all 30 of the Dow, of the top Dow 30, who knows how many of the Fortune 500, he knows. Um, but he is, and they, they, they own many of the world's great uh, public relations brands, including some of many of Washington's great brands, Hilda Milton, Burson, Marsteller, uh, and a whole host of others. Uh, this is, one, this is one of the people in the world who both knows best how companies choose to present themselves to the world, but also how countries choose to present themselves to the world. And he's here to help us understand today exactly how public diplomacy, nation branding, country branding all come together in today's modern world. Please put your hands together and join me in thanking Sir Martin for joining us today. Thanks, General, Sir Martin, Stephen, Steve, and Nelson. Um, a couple of observations, actually, on what Nelson just said. Firstly, um, China's not rising, it's risen. So I, I, I just want to hear it. But we have this horrible phrase um, in the West, partly because we don't want China to succeed, I think. Um, I think certainly that's true of, uh, to some extent, the US. UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain. I mean, we, we, we feel we're in an unenviable position that we may be in the process of being eclipsed. I don't think America is, and we can, can come back to that if anybody wants to talk about that later, but I think it's always dangerous to underestimate America uh, just now. You've only got to look at that um, CIA report that's prepared for the president every four years. And the question being, you know, what's America going to look like in 20 years? And the answer came back to a re-elected President Obama that uh, in the next 20 years, America will be energy self-sufficient. And therefore, Saudi Arabia will be China and India's problem, not America's. And secondly, if you look at some of the manufacturing developments, like 3D printing and similar techniques, American manufacturing might be much more dominant than people give it credit for. So never underestimate America. But China's, China's risen. I mean, you've got to remember that China is now the second largest economic power having eclipsed Japan, um, depending on which measure you look at a year or so ago, 
uh, certainly in advertising, it's the second largest market. And if you look at the world's economy, it's 72 trillion or thereabouts of GNP, and Ch uh, US is about 16 trillion, and China's about eight and a half. And so you, you, you've really got to remember that, I think. So that's one thing. And the second thing, you, you said you use a crass phrase like branding. Branding to me is not crass. Uh, branding, you're right on, uh, whatever the right American way of expressing it. You know, the call to talk about branding is absolutely critical. And understanding that, that you know, I was just looking at, um, at the risk of losing my notes, I was looking at what we're doing currently. So in our, in our um, latest The Wire, which is our, our internal newspaper, both traditional legacy newspaper, and new newspaper, digital. We're working on India, we're working on Aruba, we're working on Mexico, we're working on South Africa, we're working on Qatar, we're working on USA, on Brand USA, we're working on Melbourne, we're working on Hong Kong. Now there are others, but those are some of those that we highlighted just in our, in our thing. So, so government, government uh, spending, there, there is two things I think we really need to think about. First of all, what we're talking about, country branding or city branding, is a subset of uh, what I would call government spending. And if you looked at WPP's results in the last two, three quarters, the segment of our business that has been growing the fastest, you would never believe it, given the pressure on government spending in various parts of the world. But the, the segment that's growing fastest is government spending. So if I looked at um, our last three quarters, actually, so it's the last three quarters of calendar 2012, government spending was growing the fastest at a time when you would think the reverse was the case. And in many countries, the government in all its forms, and we cover not just advertising, we cover advertising, we cover media, what we call media investment management, which is media planning and buying, we cover consumer insight, which is market research, public relations and public affairs, branding and identity, healthcare communications, and digital, basically. Uh, so it's aspects of government spending that covers that. But you have to remember, you know, if I if I gave you the 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 view of WPP of the world and how the world's changing from a marketing perspective, I've come up with about nine or ten things that we see happening. One of the biggest things we see happening is a is a maintenance of government involvement. But if you looked at the precedent for what's happening today, the nearest precedent historically would be the Great Depression of 1929. And government involvement as regulator, investor, intervener, <coughs> stimulator, uh, communicator, in the 30s continued really at a very, very high levels, at least until World War II. And then, of course, in the context of World War, um, uh, government became an even more important player. But government, you know, the message would be government is here to stay generally. And then we'll move into now the subset of that, which is country branding. Now, it's been phrased as country branding, I think. And I, I wanted just to modify it a little bit. You know, all good agencies ignore the brief. I won't be deterred from ignoring the brief. Uh, in one sense, this is not just about country branding, it's about city branding. So, uh, one of our agencies at Ogilvy does a, a campaign, or has been doing a campaign for IBM for many years, which started as Smarter Planet, and has now gone, has been honed or refined to Smarter City. Now, why is that? Well, 50% of the world's population, the six and a half billion, already live in cities. The, I think the prognosis is that by 2030, I think it is, 70% of the world's population <coughs> So country, country branding, the positioning of countries, has become, or will become, an even more important phenomenon. It's how you position a country and how you position a city-state. I mean, Nelson mentioned Singapore, and I'll come back to Singapore because I think it is one of the, the paragons of virtue in terms of branding, and I'll come back to the structural issue, which I think is the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is not that people fail to understand the importance of crass branding. They, don't, they do understand that. What they don't understand is how to implement it. It's about strategy and it's about structure. It's about implementation and that's where people fall down. But let me just make one or two observations 
uh, about country, country branding and to some extent city branding. Remembering that city branding is critically important. Now, we work with the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson. We work with the Mayor of Rome, Mira Alamano. In two weeks time I'm going to Jerusalem to work with the Mayor of Jerusalem. We put together, we take the, actually it's very interesting, we take the Chinese experience. I'm deputy chairman of the Mayor of Shanghai's board, it's called IBLAC, International Leader, Business Leaders Advisory Council, very pretentious title, but really interesting. For 20 years, the Mayor of Shanghai, more than 20 years, the Mayor of Shanghai, and indeed the Mayor of Beijing, I think for a similar period, have invited CEOs of major corporations to come and advise them one, one day a year, so you go, you, we have an afternoon where we do usually an environmental act, you know, releasing sturgeon into the river, planting a tree, releasing birds. My bird actually limped. <laughs> uh, limped away from me, didn't fly away from me. It was a bit, a bit uh, dispiriting, but he was okay. He, was okay. he or she was okay. Um, but we, we do an environmental thing, we have a dinner with the Communist Party Secretary of uh, Shanghai and the mayor. And then the following day, we uh, have previously been given a subject, could be an environmental subject, whatever, um, education, infrastructure, <coughs> traffic, congestion, whatever it is, and we've, we, we do a paper, a lengthy paper, which is translated meticulously into Chinese for the bureaucracy. And they pick about out of the 55 CEOs. And by the way, they insist it's the CEO of the worldwide company. They won't take regionals or regional presidents. It has to be. And you have to attend every year. And if you don't attend every year, you're off. And you, they pick about five or ten of the CEOs to make presentations. They choose them each year uh, from, from the group. And you make a presentation, brief presentation to the bureaucracy, probably usually about three or four or five minutes in length. And of course, the Chinese have this horrible habit of listening, you know, which we forgot about in the West, and learning. And when you run, and they don't fall asleep. And most of you will be asleep by the time I'm finished. Uh, they don't fall asleep. They sit there rigorously. So I, I use it as an example. So we're doing that with we do that with Boris Johnson in London, we're doing that with Alamana in Rome, and we're going to do it with the Mayor of Jerusalem, uh, and indeed in, we're going to go into Ramallah as well to look at the. Other, other side of the equation, the equal equation. So I, I use those examples because these are people who understand, you know, the importance of branding in a city context. So let me just make a few observations very quickly, and then come back to the structural issue, and then we can open up for Q and A. The first is um, observation is that subtlety is extremely important. Subtlety works. Uh, it's interesting that you know, the Japanese have come out with a cool Japan program recently. Uh, which mirrors what the British did with Cool Britannia uh, under Tony Blair's government, you know, which was, a, it was seen as really, in, in, done in 1997, it was seen as being too hokey, really, too sort of folksy, and uh, that was probably a little bit crass, actually. Um, but what's worked actually much, much better recently is this Great Britain campaign. Now, unfortunately, it's not been funded, I think, to the degree that it should be, and I was at the the launching here at the, here in the United States of it, the, the, the U.S. element of it, uh, a year or so ago with Mayor Bloomberg and with the, with the Prime Minister, with David Cameron, uh, and with, there was a great discussion as to what, what the investment should be, but it's the Great Britain campaign. And what's really interesting, and this is really fundamental and very important, the reason that campaign has been, I think, successful is, number one, the branding has been good in using the Great Britain. We can argue whether Britain is great or not, but great entrepreneurs, great innovation, great tourism, whatever it is, but it has a common theme running across all government departments. No government department can propagate itself or communicate without using the template. And this, you know, this rigid, what may seem to some to be, rigid, to be rigidity is absolutely fundamental. So, so what little you see in the campaign, and there should be more, I think, it should be invested in more. What little you see is perfectly coordinated. And every minister knows that, and every civil servant knows that when they communicate, they have to use the template. So subtlety works. Subtlety, the cool J Japanese one, we, we, we have an internal uh, award scheme for WPP for the best published work 
externally. And Christopher Graves, who runs Ogilvy Public Relations Worldwide, uh, was the winning, the Grand Prix entry. There are different sort of segments, depending on whether it's public relations or design. But his in the, in the public relations, branding and identity area uh, was on Cool Japan, the Cool Japanese campaign, which we think is a little bit, um, again, sort of mirroring some of the, the mistakes of Cool Britannia, but his was the winning entry, and he goes into exhaustive detail, actually, of, of, of how the Japanese have attempted to do it and how they may have done it not quite the right way. So that's the first point about subtlety. The second point is that companies and products, ironically, may be the most powerful branding drivers for countries. So the efficiency and reliability of a BMW or of a Mercedes-Benz tells more about it, or VW actually. You know, VW is probably now the largest automobile fan manufacturer worldwide. Tells more, you, more, more about Germany uh, than money uh, the country could spend on a branding campaign. So to some extent, what you do at a government level or at a city level is, is negated by what the images are uh, of products. So for example, you know, French Hermes scarves and the French sense of style is dictated by uh, their, you know, a company like LVMH, which is one of the most successful branding companies in the world in the luxury area, obviously it determines what people think about, about France. For the US, what do you think about when you think about the US? You think about Coca-Cola, you think about McDonald's, good or bad. You might think about other fast food companies and, and restaurants as well, but there again, the image of America is fashioned by that. And there's a, a danger that some countries might be too tied to single companies. I mean, if you look at the challenges that Nokia is facing and think about how that conditions people to thinking about Finland, you know, it was wonderful when Nokia was soaring, but obviously when Nokia is much more challenged, it comes under pressure. So to some extent, what you do is outside your control because it depends on the success of the major companies. Now, the, the reverse of that is that a poor reputation uh, can hurt commercial interests. I mean, a very interesting business school study, IMB, uh, found, found out that 43% uh, of Americans said they'd be less likely to buy a computer from a Chinese-owned Lenovo, despite the fact that it was the same product that IBM had marketed successfully for years. Now, we were talking a little bit about that, and that might be for irrational reasons, that might be for, um, for uh, sort of racist reasons in a, in a sense, or chauvinistic reasons, but it does show you that reputation, you know, what a country stands for, if you brand it, in this case Chinese, that it might have a negative consequence for political reasons, irrational reasons, emotional reasons, as well as factual reasons. Uh, so that's the third point. Poor reputation can hurt you uh, as well. The fourth point is that culture does med matter a, a, an awful lot. And this, uh, this, I think, is a fascinating little case study. Not one that we did. Uh, in 1984, the Australian Tourism Commission, uh, co uh, Commission commissioned a series of television advertisements promote, pr to promote American visits to Australia. And they used Paul Hogan. Uh, and who was unknown in the US, Crocodile Dundee, you may, you may remember him, in the US saying that he would, quote, I won't imitate his accent, uh, <laughs> slip an extra sh shrimp on the barbie for you, unquote. Even though the o Australians use the word prawn, they don't use the word shrimp. Uh, if you use prawns in America, you probably wouldn't have got anywhere at that time. And instead of shrimp, and shrimp consumption is much higher in the US than in Australia. The, advertis the advertising premiered in the, the NFL a conference championship game in January of 1984. And before the campaign, Austria would, Australia, not Australia, Australia was number 78 on the most desired vacation destination list for all Americans and became number seven, so from 78 to seven, within three months after the launch. And when Hogan became famous in 1986 with the movie Crocodile Dundee, Australia became, soon became the number one or two on Americans' dream vacation list remaining in that position for most of the next two decades. So it shows you, you know, how branding, personalities, celebrity is very important actually in the context of all this, can, can build and change impressions. Uh, having said that, although culture might mean an awful lot, 
it's also true that good branding builds on truth. I mean, you, you, you can only sell a bad product once, even politically, I would argue, that's the case. You can probably get away with it once, but you can't get away with it twice. And good examples of that in the Slovenia and Croatia, effectively, which are wonderful tourist des destinations, were extremely effective in highlight highlighting their scenic tourist locations and became hot destinations just a few years after being involved in the first European war in half a century. So it is possible where you have a good product, or it is essential to have a good product, and build on those truths. <coughs> and poor branding, the, the, the converse of that, tries to convince people of an untenable reality. So a good example of the untenable reality was the campaign for Georgia. After Georgia was routed by its war with Russia, the government launched a quote, a campaign where the tagline was, the winner is Georgia, would you believe? And the campaign attempted to show it was a better place to visit and do business than nature, nations such as France or indeed China, but ignoring its loss on the battlefield. I won't tell you which agency was responsible for that, but it was one of our competitors. Um, so, so don't try and brand something that is poor. You know, the truth will win out. And the final point before I come on to what I think is the heart of it is the best branding is, is good policy. So just as it's difficult for ads, whether they're online or offline, to overcome poor products, national branding has a t hard time overcoming poor policies. And America has been best, I'll take America as an example, has been best regarded around the world when public policies, be they going back in, in time, say the Berlin airlift, or the response to a tsunami in Asia, have shown the best aspects of what makes America a great nation. So that gives you uh, some, some thoughts. Let me just come to, to what I think is the heart of the issue. And this, this is really becoming more and more important. Because in, in a world where you know, companies actually are nation states, and companies can shift, and this is, you know, this is contentious stuff, and this is controversial stuff, because companies can shift their location now. You know, we moved and were criticized for moving from London to Dublin. We've since moved back to London, uh, to the UK. Uh, we were worried about uh, the, the, the Labour administration imposing a tax uh, on overseas earnings, whether remitted or not. We, we operate on a remittance basis. So if we leave one is out, outside the UK, unremitted, uh, we would pay obviously local tax, but the threat was that we would be taxed overseas, uh, whether we were taxed on the overseas earnings, the UK tax rate, so double tax effectively, even if we left it abroad. It was called control foreign corporation legislation. The, the, the new government, the coalition government between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, gave us an assurance with legislation and other companies that that will be not, not will be the case, and we move back. So, the point I'm making is that co the companies make investment decisions increasingly on where the best place is to locate. So, country branding or city branding involves the globalization of companies, tax spending, infrastructure, education, technology, all the issues that worry the president of this country, the prime minister of, of my country, of my national country, all those things are critically important in terms of country branding, city branding, and location. And if I was looking, um, Nelson mentioned you know, uh, Singapore. If I was looking for the two best examples of branding, the two countries the opposite ends of the spectrum that I think get it right, I would certainly pick Singapore, 5.3 million people, 40% of which, by the way, are foreigners. Non, and the big domestic issue in, in Singapore, big political issue, is when that figure goes above 50%. Because obviously, if you have a large population from outside, from when it, wherever they come, and the impact that they have on housing, education, infrastructure, etc., cetera, is, crit is critically important. But I would choose Singapore as the best example. Now, people would say it's a very autocratic country, very highly governed, you know, no chewing gum on the pavement, is probably the most extreme, you know, extreme example of it. But having said that, it works extremely effectively 
and all the policies there are linked together. The, we work very closely with the EDB, the Economic Development Board. We have 3,000 people in Singapore. I think the largest employer there is Seagate with about 5,000 people. We are certainly in the top five, six, seven companies in terms of the number of people we have. It's a regional hub. It's becoming more and more popular, uh, not just because of low taxation, but because of technology. It's well wired because of education because of, uh, of communications, infrastructure, both hard and soft infrastructure. You know, get to the airport within 15 to 20 minutes and it works. But it's on a small scale. At the opposite end of the spectrum, and you may not like what I'm going to say, but I do think China gets it right too. Now, for example, if you go to Davos and you speak to any of the Chinese delegations there, it's almost as though they have a little sort of mission statement in their pocket. They have three points, and they repeat it to you ad nauseum. They are very much on message, and it's extremely well co coordinated, whether you're talking about SOEs, state-owned enterprises, or private companies. So if you ask me who are the best examples at the moment currently, who've got it all together, I would say those are two, two very good examples. There are others, but two very good examples. And let me just sort of come, come really to what I think is the heart of it. Uh, I, I won't say which government but a recently elected uh, presidential campaign that we worked on, uh, it was at Davos, we, we met the candidate who ultimately won the, the presidential campaign. And he asked me, he said, um, you know, what, what advice would you, you give me? And I, I'm not, despite the build-up that Nelson gave me, I'm certainly not the best brain on this by any means, but I do have some knowledge and experience of it. And I said to him, well, look, if you're gonna, in, in terms of branding and branding this particular country, which has got bags of potential, has got realized, realized uh, success, and bags of potential. I said, really, what you have to do is you have to pull it all together. The president or prime minister of a country is in exactly the same position, in my view, as the chairman and or CEO of a company. They are the brand guardians uh, of that country. And now, the unfortunate thing about politics, I've been CEO for WPP for 28 years. Uh, the average CEO only lasts about four and a half year, uh, years, I'm told, in America. I think worldwide it's only three years. So actually it's got less than political tenure, actually, to it. And the problem with politics, of course, is you have to get elected, which increasingly is true for CEOs as well. You have to get elected. And those elections usually take place every four or five years, so it's quite difficult to have longevity. But I said to this, this guy who was a candidate at the time, pull it you have to pull it together. You can't have different ministers going off with their ministries in different directions. So think back to the Great Britain campaign. Having that template of which ministers who have various political objectives and temporal political objectives, particularly when they get closer to an election and they want to get messages out to the electorate, and they often use government budgets. You, know, you can argue about the fairness of that to do it. Obviously, the opposition always complains about it. But pulling it all together structurally is the critical issue. You can't have people going off in different directions. If you're running a tourism budget, the investment budget, the education budget, the infrastructure budget, it all has to be coordinated. And I don't think governments get it. The interesting thing about cities is that mayors and governors of states, I think, actually get it, are increasingly getting it more and more, and it might be because of that statistic, you know, the IBM statistic that 70% of the world's population will be in cities in a very short period of time. And you're starting to see some really interesting things happen, particularly events. I'm on the board of Formula One, uh, which is now private equity control, but it's one of three major sporting events, live sporting events, that have a critical, critical impact on how people perceive countries or cities. The, 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 probably the biggest impact comes from either the Olympics, not so much the Winter Olympics, I think, but the Summer Olympics, and the World Cup. And the third one, I would say, will be Formula One. And you know, what, what happens in these cases is that countries or cities take these on because they see them as changing the impression. And good, you have to have a good product, to come back to the point about good product but changing the impression that people have about a country or a city. So let's give you concrete examples. Beijing 
you know, if China was rising pre-Beijing, post-Beijing it had risen. China, Beijing proved what the Chinese could do. The opening ceremonies and closing ceremonies, the opening ceremony in particular, and quite controversial in some respects, even within China, even I think I'm told within the Politburo. But when you looked at it, if you look at its technological capability, the scale on which they did, the creativity was quite extraordinary. And it changed the image that the world had, I think, of Beijing, of China, and of Asia. The World Cup, the Football World Cup in South Africa, quite controversial in the South African context, changed the image, I think, of South Africa, and more importantly, Africa on a world stage. And I would argue that the London Olympics, you know, everybody said, well, the British will mess this up. And we didn't. Or rather, Sebastian Coe and his crew didn't. They did a fantastic job. And the opening ceremony, although it was quirky, although it was probably less flamboyant or certainly less expensive than Beijing, was you know, uniquely, I think, British, very historical. It was one man's view of history. But Danny Boyle, who, who did uh, uh, Slumdog Millionaire and, other, and other, other films, was drafted in, and he did an extraordinary job. And again, that created an impression of Great Britain, Brand Britain, which I think was very different uh, the, to what people expected. And the last thing I would say, you know, one of the areas of the world that we're very excited about, you know, we're just a few yards away from the uh, Inter-American Development Bank run by Luis Moreno, he and I both believe that this is the decade of Latin America. I would argue that despite the infrastructure issues that Brazil faces with the World Cup next year, and it's only next year in 2014, and with the Olympics in, in Rio, which is a very, you know, running an Olympics is a very complex event. Despite the challenges, my bet would be that the world's view of Brazil, of Rio, and more importantly, Latin America, will change as a, positively, will change positively <coughs> as a result of what you see. All these things, what you see in the next year in the World Cup and in 2016 at the Rio Olympics, all these things have a massive impact on people's thinking. And if you take Formula One, I'll just end on Formula One, for example, it costs about $200 million to put on a Formula One event, to build a track, to build the infrastructure around it, etc. Why do countries do that? And it's interesting, if you look at the Formula One calendar, it shifted from the old world to the new world. The new races are Shanghai and Singapore, and Korea, South Korea. Those are where the new tracks bar rain controversially. That's where the new tracks are being built. Why do people do it? Because they see it as altering the image, reputation, and branding of the country and positioning it as a more and more important destination. So I think, I hope that helps a little bit what we see in, in country branding. But I, I would just finally, finally emphasize the issue of structure. Everybody focuses on strategy and the thinking of it. It's critically important, obviously, but it's no good having a strategy you don't implement. And the biggest problem, going back to that presidential candidate, which it's interesting, since he's become president of that particular country, he is integrating it quite heavily. So he has taken, I think, the advice to heart. But it's very difficult to do, particularly when you have coalition governments. Very tough, because coalitions are about compromise. And you, in country branding, you can't have compromise. You've got to have a strategy which you which you implement vigorously. Thank you very much. I'm amazed, as you were, I think, when you talk about the last two quarters, the increase in government spending has been yeah. the biggest increase in your sector. In this country, when they talk about foreign aid or foreign investment, uh, and of course now we're in the sequestration and all this kind of business, it, it, it seems like there is absolutely no interest to increase any money or budgeting into our branding aspect of it or into foreign aid or any part of that. Do you have any comment or thoughts about that in particular? Well, I think you have to be very careful. I mean, you know, can't be it for me. I'm, I'm a foreigner in your land, and therefore it's, it's, it's um, invidious for me. This won't stop me from commenting. Um, America, you know, America, if you believe that you know, a balanced budget or a more balanced budget, the less debt is, uh, is the, the better route, ultimately. 
and that you can't kick the can down the road uh, you know, for, for, forever, and that you have to face the reality of $16 trillion of, of debt. And that's what I believe. I mean, you, you can argue as to how extreme you have to be, whether it should be $4 trillion or whatever it is, you, you know, Simpson Bowles is the right thing or whatever it is, you can argue about that. But that means that America increasingly is going to have to have priorities. And that inevitably means that you know defense, defense decisions, um, investment decisions, foreign aid decisions, increasingly you're going to have to prioritize this. Uh, and that the the time of plenty, you know, not gone, but you know we have to be more careful where we spend our money. I mean, and you know there's a there's a really interesting thing in, that I think uh, from a foreign policy point of view that has been happening in the last few years, which I've noticed in the context of our business. You know, Africa and uh, Latin America are increasingly important. In fact, Latin America was the fastest growing region last year, and my bet would be it would be the fastest growing region for us this year. And one third of our business comes from Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Central Eastern Europe, the so-called BRICS and next level, you know, Jim O'Neill's uh, things. The Chinese have understood this for years. So whilst we were focused, whilst the West was focused on Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq. China was sort of, in a way, attacking the soft underbelly of our foreign policy and priorities in Africa. 800,000 Chinese in Africa, you know, doing projects. You know, you go to Kenya. You know, I've gone to Nairobi on a Sunday and I've driven into Nairobi and every bridge that I've gone under is being manufactured by a Chinese construction company on the highway. Latin America. You know, I'll give you a good example. When when Santos <coughs> was uh, appointed, uh, was inaugurated uh, as as president after Uribe uh, in Colombia. You mentioned Chile. I think Colombia is much more interesting country in the context of uh, Latin American development. But I always remember I went there for the inauguration to Bogota, and uh, you know we had a one of our uh, the British had one of our, our ministers, perfectly able, good guy, there. Uh, and and Santos, in his inauguration speech, said, I'm going to build uh, a million houses because lower middle income people, families in Bogota or Colombia didn't have enough housing. Who did the Chinese have at the inauguration? The housing minister. So they, they think, you know, they think about these things much more intensely, and, and you know, we were talking about this a little bit before we yeah. the session. You, know, you mentioned from your own experience how carefully they think about it. They they really do think. They really do listen. They do go through the or shucks routine. You know, we don't really know. We're the, you know, we're we're just learning. Um, they really do plan and think very carefully. So I think coming back to your question. I think America has to think in the same way, very carefully. just like the British have you know, to. You know, we've had to reduce our defense spending, spending security, spending foreign aid. And foreign aid is one of the areas of the budget that hasn't been cut. You know, the austerity um, cuts have not, you know, foreign aid has been one of the things that Osborne, the Chancellor, Kuhlman, the Treasury Secretary, uh, and the Prime Minister have said, it is, if not sacrosanct, certainly is one of the areas that have been. So I think, you know, America has to get used to that. Having said that, you know, I've got to underline, my, I'm very bullish on the United, States, the United States. It's fashionable not to be, and it's fashionable to question it. I think it's very dangerous. I, and I think when you think about oil and energy and shale, and you think about these improvements in manufacturing, if any of you have seen 3D printing, and you know, I'm just focusing on one technique, it is phenomenal what you can do, and it's on a very small scale now, but what we might be able to do from a manufacturing point of view with 3D, manuf 3D printing in a manufacturing context. <coughs> so this, to my mind, is like in the 80s where we said Japan was going to take over the world, or people said it was going to take over the world, and along came Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher a bit in the context. Whatever you think about it, um, make it made a difference. So I think be careful. Uh, I think America actually is in a much more powerful position than we could for some people. Thank you. All right, you remember my ground rules on asking a question. If you just raise a hand and I'll recognize you and then if you could state your name and affiliation loudly so we can all hear it. We'll, uh, we'll go ahead. Yes, sir, in the back. 
Sir, my name is Pete Dillon. I'm the Marine Corps Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, you talked briefly or, or uh, pointed out that what you're talking about is opinion shaping. Do you believe that you can shape extreme opinions that may have already had the root forms? So, for example, our target audience and our national efforts to sway opinions for those who might wish us ill. How do we do that? Well, you, you know, it is about hearts and minds. So, I mean, I, I don't think you can, you know, it's like the old argument about is can force win out alone? I mean, force cannot win out alone. You know, the, this is, you know, propaganda cannot win out alone in the same way. You have to, it is about hearts and minds. You know, if, for example, you were thinking about how do you solve, what, what is the best way of solving, apart from military means, what is the best way of solving uh, problems? It is through economic progress. You know, what, what, what is the reason for the Arab Spring? What are the reasons? Youth unemployment, high food prices, you know, lack of education, whatever the, the, the reasons are. So how could you have avoided those problems is by addressing and dealing with those issues. And this is about winning people's hearts and minds. I mean, the, the, the analogy to, to a commercial transaction, I think, is selling a bad product. You can't sell a bad product, I think, beyond one time. You might be able to fool somebody one, either at the, you know, either in the supermarket or at the polls. But if the product doesn't fulfill the promise, you can't do it a second time. You know, the consumer, you know, David Ogilvy famous, said the consumer is not a moron. This is terribly politically incorrect in today's environment. The consumer is not a moron, it's my wife. So you would say, the consumer is not a moron, it's my partner now. And, 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 but he's dead right. And you can't, you know, that, that you must credit consumers with a tremendous amount of intelligence. You can't fool them. So I think, you know, to your question about, it, it's really about hearts and minds. And you, you have to win the hearts and minds. And you said people who want to cause us ill, um, you've then got to try and look at the root causes of why it is that they wish us ill. And there will all be the, always be those sorts of people. And try and deal with those issues. And, um, you know, if I look at, for example, uh, Israel and Palestine, you know, a lot of the problems, and I went to the, the the Vital Voices Awards last night, and there was this this Palestinian woman who uh, was uh, uh, was one of the awards, and she is building a 40,000 unit housing development, lower and middle, l lower, mid lower income housing in Palestine, uh, because she believes that there's not enough, she and her partner believe, there is not enough housing for here. It's all at the, the top end, or the middle end. It's not lower, middle, and lower. So, you know, I, you, I look at that, I use that as just an example, it's top of my mind, because I saw, I saw that last night. I, I think that's a very good example of what behind, is behind your question and the way you have to deal with it. You have to deal with the root causes of this. And, the capitalist system with all this. I mean, i just give you an interesting little story. So, so I went with Hank Paulson and seven other CEOs to the um, China Advanced Leadership Program, CALP, which is the, it's in Shanghai. It's a magnificent campus. It's what I call the Chinese Harvard Business School. And uh, we had two days with the 40 chairmen and CEOs of what is known as SASAC. Now, SASAC is the government holding company uh, which controls all of the state-owned enterprises, all the government-owned enterprises. And these companies have a combined uh, turnover of $2.2 trillion. I mean, it's a bit of a cheat because the government might own 20%, so you're just consolidating all of it. And at the last time I checked, about two or three years ago, uh, that combined uh, sales were about 1.79 trillion. It gone up to about 2.2 trillion. And we, you know, we sat and we, we talked to these these uh, CEOs for two days. And by the way, they listened. They didn't fall asleep. They took notes. 
No, not like when you're you're in, in London or you know they're all half asleep after ten minutes. And they sat there for two days, all in their white shirts, short sleeve sh shirts. It reminded me a little bit of IBM in the sixties, but in a in a different in a different way. And then we had a sort of private um, conversation with a dinner with several of them, several of the CEOs and, and, and from the Chinese side. <clears throat> and, and I and we said to them, you know, what is the what is the biggest challenge you face? And they said, well, having the state as your sole shareholder is is difficult because you have very little flexibility. You know, you need more entrepreneurial. I think they actually use the word entrepreneurial flexibility. So there was that. Then I thought, what are we doing in the West? We're going the opposite direction. We're going towards more regulation, more intervention, and whatever the rights and wrongs are. And I'm not saying there aren't rights about you know, corporate governance, executive pay, all the, all the things that, that people are very focused on. But the irony was, they're looking, and they will get it, by the way. They will get more flexibility. They will move more to the sort of freedom sort of economic freedom, whilst we're going the other way. So we're becoming more regulatory. And I, I, you know, the danger is they'll be even more effective as a result of adopting more flexibility into their system. So just an example, I think, of something to see. So, but at the heart of, the, heart of it, if you win the people's hearts and minds, propaganda on its own will not work. Another question, Mr. Allman in the back. Hey, sir, my name is uh, Brian Salas. I'm with the uh, Bold Eagle Group. It's a, uh, one of the newest uh, full-service communications companies here. I'll ask you to comment on the what I call the Dennis Rodman effect in uh, uh, popular we own, culture. We own a piece of vice, so, so, uh, so don't Google vice, by the way. Google vice.com. You Google vice, so God knows what you get. Um, so so we, we own 9% of vice. And, and, uh, but when you say comment on the Dennis Rodman phenomenon, what? In yeah, what, in what the, aspect? The uh, popular culture and their effect on the national brand, and uh, you know his recent visit to North Korea, and then how the does, effect on who though? North Korea? On yes, sir. Us? On uh, other on the export of American culture, popular culture from any country to other countries, and how does that affect uh, well, I think policy? It's rather, that nice, kind of thing? it's rather nice that the the, the North Korean. Supreme Leader uh, likes basketball, <laughs> um, and, and it's engaged. I, I, Shane, Shane Smith, who runs Vice, uh, told me, and I think it was premiered last night actually in New York uh, on HBO. Uh, I think there's 18 hours of tape. I think it's 18 hours. Um, I don't know whether everybody's going to sit there and watch 18 hours of tape, um, but it is sort of interesting. I mean, it, it, this was a, a Vice special. I mean, Vice had done. What I would call extreme news acts, because um, they have several verticals: travel, news, music, films, everything. Um, and obviously, in the news area, Shane and Eddie Moretti, the creative director, have been quite aggressive. I, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, I think um, it was a, an extraordinary event. Uh, we have other, seen other North Korean excursions. You know, Eric Schmidt made his. Uh, his trip with Bill Richardson. I, at the end of the day, I think it probably is um, a, a way of engagement, whether it's the best way of engagement with the North Korean regime or not. I don't know. We were talking a little bit about it. I was in South Korea last week, and um, I think actually, you know, there is a, a, a great degree of concern in South Korea, but I think probably we are more concerned about it, that was my sense, than they are that they see the status quo as probably continuing and low probability of any famous last words of anything extreme happening, either because they don't have the capability or because it's words and it's early stages in a new regime. Uh, somebody said to me, this is the third generation and the gene pool shows little signs of weakening. So I, you know, the the Rodman thing, I think, was, uh, you know, it, it was a vice um, news program, news effort. Yes, ma'am. All the way back. Hi, uh, Lydia DePillis, The New Republic magazine. Um, do you have a sense of the implications of this next month? Um, new top-level domains will be rolling. Sorry, I can't hear. Um, so ICANN, the Internet Corporation for. Right. Okay. 
rolling out new top-level domains, they talk a lot about the expansion of the internet and how the opportunities for speech and branding. Um, there are many of your branding colleagues think this is going to be a terrible thing. Um, what's your take for nations, for cities, um, for brands themselves? Well, the, gro the growth of, of social communication and uh, all positive. I mean, if you, if it's a reality. So, you know, it's a bit like Canute and the waves. I mean, you can't, you're not going to be able to stop it. Uh, regimes that thought they could stop it uh, are increasing, increasingly <laughs> going to be engulfed. So it, you, you have to, it's you know, like running a company. Everything inside your company you have to regard, and every written word you have to look at as though it was there on the internet. I and mean, we've seen that all time, every time. So there is no, you know, there is no opacity anymore. Um, if you're running a city or you're running a country, you have to utilize, you know, if, if you looked at um, the Obama campaign, what is the thing that really, I, to, to my mind, as a you know, foreign eye looking at it, the, the Obama uh, machine, political machine, understood the importance of women, single women, Hispanics, Afro-Americans, the young, in a far more sophisticated way, I would say, than the Republican or Romney machine, political machine. Uh, they organized themselves extremely effectively. I remember talking to somebody on election day uh, who said they'd just received a communication from the Democratic headquarters that said, um, we know you voted, your sister in Ohio has not voted. I think he was in Alabama or somewhere. Could you call her <laughs> and get her to vote? And you know, one of our agencies, Blue State Digital, uh, were heavily involved in the in the fundraising campaigns, both times for the Obama thing. So we, we've seen social communication at work. The Orca cam, uh, the Orca software, as I understand it, which Romney uh, was using, um, broke down on election day. So understanding the implications of it, and by the way, you know, in this morning's papers or yesterday's papers, we've seen that the EU is moving in a concerted way on the privacy issues that Google have, and we're going to see more of that. I mean, this is the first time that I think the privacy issue, you know, has affected Google. I think in a more concerted way. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a change, and I think the EU. It's probably taking a slightly different approach, a more vigorous approach, it, it appears. And it's very concerted between, I think, four or five countries um, in, the, in the EU uh, on the privacy issue. And so, you know, the governments will be concerned about some of the areas, like privacy. But generally, I mean, you would be like Canute in the waves well, if I, you ignored this I stuff. hate to interrupt. I just meant more specifically the uh, top-level domain, so like dot .nyc, dot Verizon. There's a lot of concern about fraud, about all of these new ones being available in the next year or so. Yeah, well, okay. Well, well, let me ask you this. What's the alternative? You, you restrict it? Okay, so you restrict it, but it, it doesn't mean that you're going to limit, limit its power. And if you're talking about it in the context of country and city branding, these are much more affordable techniques. You know, the absolute levels of spending uh, because of the audiences are much more fragmented, the absolute levels of spending are very much lower, and they're very much more personalized. And you can measure them more easily. You know, what, what a large part of our business is in audience measurement, both a legacy media and new media. So I would argue that the, the, there are risks, whether it's privacy, whether it's the naming risk that you mentioned, whatever, um, and the, the fraud risk. I mean, cyber security is, you know, probably the number one issue, or close to the number one issue that we all have to deal with in companies now. And you've seen the cyber attacks in the last few weeks, and the prevalence of them. So there are um, there are problems that come with these techniques. But in, in terms of if I'm trying to run a city or a country, I think this gives me tremendous power to reach every person in the population on a personalized basis, which is a technique that we never had before. And it supplements. 
Thanks. 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 We can take one more in this young lady right here. I'd like to say the best. I said it, it should be should be part of it. It should be yeah. part of it. So I'm interested to see how your organization confronts, let's say, poor policies and clients hired in a, a prominent case might be, and this is individual, uh, Uhura Kenyatta, who just won the election in Kenya, you know, hiring a UK lawyer to help him face the ICC and how you sort of walk the line between maybe an ethical or moral obligation to advise them on a specific mm -hmm. policy that might be at odds with what they actually want to do. It's a, it's a bit off country branding and, and the subject matter, but I'll have a go. Um, <laughs> won't stop me. No, I think it, it's a matter of, of decision and judgment. You know, I mean, everything now is you know, I get myself into hot water in the UK for saying that you know, the the level of corporation tax that you pay, not that you pay the corporation, but it's a matter of judgment. It's a it's a, it's a sort of moral decision in the sense that if you're running a multinational company, you know you it's not you can decide what you know by locating your operation. I mean, for example, you don't have to move out of London to Dublin to alter the corporation tax that you pay. You can sit in London and you can move your procurement department to Switzerland or your branding department to Ireland and you don't have to really change the locus or certainly the the, uh, the domicile. So a lot of the areas in which we operate in, because of the globalization of a business, particularly in corporations, is a matter of judgment. So your, the question you're asking about, you know, who you represent, who you work for, what you do, is a question of judgment. And you know, some people have different, you know, taking the analogy to tax, some people say I'm not going to pay any tax. And set up there, and perfectly legally, not, not evasion, avoidance, okay? So they're totally within the law. Uh, but now, in the environment in which we operate in, people are taking a different attitude. They're saying, Whatever the law is, you know, given the difficulties that econom ec economists face, the austerity, you know, fifty percent youth unemployment in Spain, fifty percent. General levels of unemployment of fifteen to twenty, but fifty percent youth unemployment. One in two people can't find jobs. You know, the, there's something more fundamental at work here. So. I, I liken it to you, the question you've asked because I think it's a question of judgment. So whether you, you if you're the UK lawyer who decides to represent Kenya, who has been elected by the country, right? So as the leader of the country, and we'll see how his war crimes, you know, what happens in terms of his trial. But I, I think it's a question of judgment. And we continually face that. We continually face that. And different people have different standards. And those standards change over time. So you may, but it's a question, it's that old fashioned thing, judgment. At the end of the day, there are no rules. You know, you can lay, lay down, it's a question of judgment. And frankly, we make mistakes. I, every day we make mistakes. But I think we, we make more good decisions than bad decisions. Have we made this mistakes in the past? Yes. Will we continue to make mistakes? Yes, it's very difficult. In complex, you know, we operate in 110 countries. And, you know, in each of those countries, there's different attitudes to the sort of issues that you're talking about. I was on a panel, you know, I, I moderated a panel in uh, South Korea la last week, on which Megawati, who was the former prime minister of Indonesia, president of Indonesia, was sitting next to Colin Powell, and she was very much against the Iraq war. And so you, you find these differences, and as a company has become more globalized, it becomes much more difficult to come to terms with them. So, so Martin, uh, I certainly appreciate your insights and uh, your optimism, which is 
pleasant optimism about America. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. And yeah. that's yeah. pleasant yeah. to us here. Um, we're so pleased you can take time out of that because I knew that would resonate with you. <laughs> <laughs> branding, branding. Well, thank you very much. We thanks to Martin Sorrell. Thank you.